Good morning. I would like to welcome you all to the AIDS Education Month 2022 uh, webinar. Today's topic is Post-Exposure Prophylactics 101, the basics, and we have a number of panelists here to speak to with you, but I'm going to introduce Dr. Nancy Etchison, uh, who will be the moderator for the panel. I'll pass it over to Nancy. Okay, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, I think Joe is going to put up some slides, but we wanted to sort of run through the very basics of post-exposure prophylaxis and uh, to talk a little bit about the new post-exposure prophylaxis hotline that I, all of us sitting here are involved in working on. And um, like Harlan said, thanks for the introduction, Harlan. I'm Nancy Atchison. I'm an infectious disease provider at Penn Medicine and I sort of work in all of our hospitals. And um, I'm gonna ask people to go around and introduce themselves very briefly, but also to include their favorite thing to do in Philadelphia during the summer before we get started. And I will start with just, I think a classic, which is Rita's. Um, the swirl cone is a big hit in my family. And so uh, that's our favorite Philadelphia summer thing. And I think we're gonna go next to Helen. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Helen Koenig. I'm also an infectious diseases doctor at Penn Medicine, practicing mostly out of um, PUP or the, the Perlman Center. Um, and I also am the medical director of the PrEP uh, program, pre-exposure prophylaxis program over at Philadelphia Fight. Um, my favorite thing to do over the summer is have ice cream by the pool. And I'm gonna pass it over to Bridget McBride. Hi, I'm Bridget McBride. I'm the HIV prevention coordinator at Penn. Um, I work primarily at Presbyterian and I do, um, I kind of oversee PrEP and PEP provision at the West Philadelphia sites. Um, my favorite thing to do in the summer in Philadelphia is uh, go to the beer gardens or art installations. Um, the Muter has a really cool garden that I like to go to in the summer. Uh so, and I'm Joe Catella, I'm the HIV care navigator at primarily at Presby. I deal, I work with new positives and out of care HIV mm -hmm. patients. And my favorite thing to do in the summer, if it's not the beer garden as well, is I bought a paddle board. So I like to go paddle boarding, not primarily in Philadelphia, but in the outskirts of Philadelphia. <laughs> Um, I'm Nancy King. I was formerly the HIV care navigator with Joe. Now I oversee our um, EAT program in the clinic with Helen, as well as our medical case management um, programs and social work programs here. Um, my favorite summer thing to do is to wear my 12-pound dog on my chest and ride bikes on a Kelly Drive. Amazing. Hi, I'm Anna Thomas Farioli. I'm the ending the HIV epidemic advisor at uh, Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Um, my favorite thing to do in Philly in the summer is to go down to South Philly and go to Pops Water Ice. Nice. <laughs> well, thank you very much to our panelists. Um, and Joe, you want to go to the next slide? So we're gonna spend the next hour together talking about PEP and like who's eligible, when they should get it, where they should get it and how they go about getting it. We'll talk a little bit about ending the HIV epidemic in Philadelphia overall. And then a little bit about PEP in Philadelphia and what we know from practice giving it here. And then some lessons from our colleagues in New York where they really started a PEP center of excellence and have built up that program in a big way. We're gonna talk about some frequently asked questions around, uh, around PEP and then walk through an example call. So what happens when you call the hotline, who you'll talk to, what questions we'll ask, all of those things. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat and we will get to them um, at the end. We have plenty of time for a question and answer. And Joe, next slide. And so hopefully in an hour and a half, you walk away from this really knowing what PEP is and when to use it and when really not to use it and maybe PrEP is a better option. And then to know all of us a little bit better so you know the faces and the voices uh, that you'll talk to when you call. Excellent, so thanks Nancy. What we're gonna start with here 
is just a brief um, review of what post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP is, just so that we're all on the same page as we move forward and talk through some of the logistics and um, and the, uh, the PEP hotline. So um, Joe, next slide, thanks. So PEP or post-exposure prophylaxis um, is essentially a medication that you take um, if you think you've had a high-risk exposure to someone living with HIV within the last 72 hours, and the goal is to prevent that person from acquiring HIV from that exposure. And we'll go through the 72 hours in a minute and also what a high-risk exposure is. And when we think about the word prophylaxis, that means, you know, an action taken to prevent an infection. So remember, again, this, unlike PrEP, that we'll talk about in a minute. This is taken after a high-risk exposure. There are two, we sort of break down PEP into two broad categories. One is occupational exposure or occupational PEP. And that's basically healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, phlebotomists, other providers, um, getting a needle stick exposure at work. So stuck by a needle in the context of taking care of somebody who is or might be living with HIV. Uh, the other broad category for, um, for PEP is what we call NPEP, or non-occupational exposure. And this is what we'll be really focusing much of the rest of the discussion on, this NPEP group. And essentially, these are folks who have had a high-risk exposure, um, and we'll talk again about what that means, um, which is typically um, a sexual exposure um, and can also be uh, an exposure through sharing needles and or equipment used to prepare drugs like cotton cookers or water. Finally, the other group of, of people that might fall into the category of folks being eligible for NPEP are those who suffer a sexual assault. Joe, next slide, please. Thanks. So here's where we want to make sure everyone understands the difference between PEP and PrEP. So Again, PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis, um, and that's going to be, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but that's going to be on the right side of this table here. Um, and I'll go through these first. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then on the left side of the table um, is PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis. And um, that is a medicine you take you can think a lot of, about like birth control in this setting where you're taking a birth control um, modality, whether it's pills, patches, injections, Nexplanon, to prevent um, an unintended pregnancy. PrEP is a medicine that you would take to prevent exposure to HIV in advance versus, again, PEP taking um, a medicine to prevent, an expo to prevent infection when you've already had an exposure. So let's go down the list on the PEP side, the right side. Um, and then we'll kind of jump back and forth to the left side to make sure we understand sort of the differences about uh, between PEP and PrEP. So again, PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. You're taking PEP within 72 hours, which is about three, which is three days after a possible exposure. Um, PEP and PrEP are for people who are not HIV positive at this moment, but PEP is for someone who just had a high-risk exposure through the through the the, the methods we mentioned. And PEP really is highly effective, not 100%, but highly effective at preventing HIV when, um, you're, when you take it um, after a high-risk exposure. And even though we, we talk about a 72-hour window, really earlier is better. So the data that we have show that if you can get in immediately after ex an exposure within hours, your chance of preventing an HIV infection is higher than if you, even if you get in towards the end of that 72 hour window. And how do you get PEP? Well, one of the new ways to get PEP is gonna be in the city of Philadelphia to call the, the PEP hotline. Um, other traditional ways to get um, PEP is um, to talk to your healthcare provider, to call them on the phone, but I would say don't wait for a call back if, they're, if you leave a message and, you know, sometimes your office may not call you back for a day or two or three. Um, this is an air, a, a time when you want to act quickly. So often people end up in the emergency room or urgent care um, as a safety net to be able to get that post-exposure prophylaxis started within the appropriate window. On the other side of the chart, again, is, is PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this is taken um, every day for some, some groups of people. Um, it can be taken on demand. 
Um, and meaning around sexual contact, this is really for men who have sex with men who are taking um, one of our two um, uh, oral prep options, which is called Truvada. Um, and there's also injections now for prep that can be every month or every other month. Um, and prep is really for folks who think they could be exposed to HIV and want to lower their risk as, as much as possible and, and not have to worry about post-exposure prophylaxis on the other side. So um, PrEP is highly effective. If used as, as prescribed, it's 99% effective, really with any of the modalities, um, if taken consistently, um, it can, it is, it's, it's about 99% effective. And in order to um, get PrEP, you should be able to, again, um, access this through your primary care provider. If you don't have a primary care provider or you're not comfortable necessarily talking with them about PrEP, um, there are a number of places you can go that can be found on preplocator.org and the website is listed right there on that table uh, in order to find um, a PrEP provider. Penn, Fight our, our PrEP providers um, as are many other places within the city of Philadelphia. Next slide, Joe. This table essentially summarizes the risk of HIV acquisition or um, uh, HIV infection after an exposure. So we've mentioned the phrase high-risk exposure a lot already, and this table kind of gets into what are those types of exposures and how, how high is the risk really of being exposed through one of these different ways. So this table kind of on the left, just to orient you, um, takes you down through different ways you could potentially be exposed to somebody um, who could, could be exposed to HIV infection from another person. Um, and on the right, it really shows you a number. And that number is the rate of HIV acquisition per 10,000 exposures. So if 10,000 people um, you know, had, for example, a blood transfusion, if you look in that first row, um, from somebody with HIV who's got a, a viral load that's not suppressed, then almost all of them, 9,250, would acquire HIV. And not to scare anyone because we now screen blood products, so there's no risk of exposure to HIV through blood transfusion. Um, so fortunately, that high-risk exposure is really no, is no longer something that we worry about, and I should add, in this country. Um, if you look down next, you can see that receptive anal intercourse um, is the next highest risk of exposure. So if you are a bottom and um, your partner is living with HIV and they are not virally suppressed, meaning their HIV viral load is not undetectable, um, then again, their risk of, of um, acquisition is 138 per 10,000 exposures. Um, and then it goes down from there. So the next highest would be needle sharing during injection drug use, followed by um, needle sticks. We talked about occupational exposure, which is 23. And then you sort of go down through the other sexual types of sexual exposure, insertive of anal intercourse, 11, all the way down. And what I wanna just point out before we move on from this slide is that oral intercourse, um, either insertive or receptive, doesn't really have a number, but is considered to be a very, very, very low risk, not zero, but very, very low risk of, um, of transmission, mode of transmission of it for HIV. And then on the lower part here of this table are all the ways in which essentially you cannot get HIV from another person. Um, and those are um, biting, if someone bites you, if someone spits at you, if someone throws bodily fluid at you, or um, sharing sex toys. And I'll just put the caveat that there's not a lot of blood in those, it, unless those, those, those um, acts are um, involving blood. For example, spitting up lots of blood in, you know, can actually pose a risk, but normal spitting, um, <laughs> for whatever that is, does not is not known to pose any risk of HIV transmission. So essentially to kind of summarize, when we think about something that could have been um, a high risk exposure, you wanna think about um, if, if I'm the person, for example, that might've been exposed. So you wanna think about what is the, my tissue of exposure? So these are the tissues that, that potentially can be exposed to and infected by HIV, think of vagina, rectum, eye, mouth, or other 
non-intact skin. So regular hand would be fine, but if you have a big injury or wound on your hand, um, that could be something um, to be concerned about. And if that if that um, surface or mucous membrane comes into contact with any of the following fluids, blood, semen, vaginal secretions, rectal secretions, breast milk, or any fluid that's visibly contaminated with blood, um, that is considered a high-risk exposure. Certainly when the source is known to have HIV, but in point of fact, we often don't know if the person we've come into contact with is living with HIV or not. Um, and so, you know, when in doubt, we assume that that person is living with HIV in terms of expecting, you know, protecting the exposed person to the best of our ability. And we often opt on the um, conservative side and treat those folks um, uh, with, with PEP. And um, it's important to remember, um, while beyond the scope of this talk, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible, meaning that if your partner is living with HIV, but their viral load is undetectable, you aren't, this would not, none of these would be considered high risk exposures because there would virtually be no chance of transmission when their viral load is undetectable. Um, and then just briefly to sort of talk about what's not something you should be worried about in terms of a high risk exposure. Um, and really it's, if, if you're exposed to someone's urine, nasal secretions, saliva, sweat, or tears, assuming, again, I would include vomit on this, assuming um, that they're not, again, visibly contaminated with blood. These are, these are um, bodily fluids that are not known to contain virus and cannot be um, uh, a mode of transmitting HIV, even if the source patient um, is living with HIV. Next slide, Joe. Um, and finally, this so this is sort of the algorithm that we've been coming towards in terms of who is eligible for PEP. Um, so essentially, um, can you guys see my pointer or no? No, okay. So yeah, someone's nodding and someone's shaking their head no. Yes, okay. So um, if somebody has had a substantial risk, a high risk exposure, and we, we talked about, thank you, Harlan, we talked about um, what those look like. Um, within 72 hours, that, and if the source person is known to have HIV, certainly, and not undetectable in terms of their viral load, certainly NPEP is, is recommended for that person. Same situation, but the source person is not, we don't know their status, um, that's case-by-case -case determination, and your healthcare provider will make a decision based on how high risk that exposure is, how likely the person is to have the, the source person is to potentially be living with HIV and also the, um, the sort of preference of the exposed person in terms of do they, would they rather take PEP or not take PEP? Um, so all those things go into the, um, into the mix. Um, if your exposure has been a, what we would consider a high risk exposure, and this is important, um, but it's been 73 or more hours beyond your exposure, technically PEP is not generally recommended. However, there is no, um, you know, biologic clock that stops at the 72 hour mark. And so it, if you've been exposed and your exposure is 73 hours or later, you should still call your provider or call the PEP hotline because often um, they will still recommend um, a course of, of PEP Again, our data in, with respect to PEP comes from animal studies and other small studies where we have general guidance around um, time since exposure. But again, there's nothing hard and fast about that 72 hour where at 72 hours you'd be eligible and 73 you definitely wouldn't. So please err on the side of caution if, if you know somebody that has been exposed and it's been over that window to have them call um, uh, just in case. And then finally, if the person has had, oh, sorry, Joe, negligible risk. So one of those things we said was not a high risk exposure, then NPEP would not be recommended. Okay, next slide. And I think I think this is my last slide. So um, this is, I won't go through all of this, but just um, to, to let you know that if you have been exposed, um, this is some of the testing that would be recommended for you um, in terms of um, the blue is the source patient, which again, we sometimes have um, if it's been an in-hospital um, exposure, like an occupational needle stick, um, we'll often be able to test the source patient, but in the community and sexual exposures in particular, um, we don't often have the source patient and we can't test them as we, as, in, as we would in an optimal setting. In the pink is what 
would happen, what would be recommended for anybody who was exposed in terms of baseline, meaning as soon as you come in, we get baseline tests. These are things that you wouldn't have been exposed to from this specific exposure, but you could have had previously. And then you can see we monitor HIV and other testing four to six weeks after exposure, three months after exposure, and then six months after exposure. Um, and then um, uh, go, you can go ahead to the next slide, Joe. Can't remember if there's talk of what do we talk about where what medications we would use or should I briefly mention that? Oh, you can briefly mention that. Okay. Um, so um, just one second on what the medications would be for, for PEP. Um, there are a few different options, but likely you would get either two pills once a day, um, one pill once a day, or one pill that you would take once a day and another pill that you would take twice a day. And that really depends on um, uh, sort of who you were exposed to potentially um, and also honestly the availability of what we can get from your pharmacy depending on the time of the day or night. Um, uh, but the good news is there are a lot of options um, and all of the options are very well tolerated and safe, generally easy to take. Um, and, um, and can be easily accessed through most pharmacies, even at funny times of the night. I think that concludes the clinical part. Hey, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative in Philadelphia and some uh, epi data. Next slide, please. Um, so here you'll see a map of who is living with HIV in uh, Philadelphia by zip code. Um, so you can see uh, citywide, there are, um, there are known to have been 18, over 18,000 people living with um, HIV. This is a prevalence of um, around 1,400 per 100,000. Um, it's a, and, and you can see that some neighborhoods have um, are in lighter colors. That means there's a lower prevalence in, in those neighborhoods. And some neighborhoods, as the colors get darker and more saturated um, along the map on the bottom, those are the neighborhoods that, um, that have higher prevalence or a higher percentage of individuals living in those zip codes uh, with, with HIV. Um, so we have a couple of um, very high prevalence sections of this of the city I'd like to point out. Um, so in West Philadelphia, there's a couple of zip codes, um, but the highest prevalence uh, zip code in, in uh, West Philadelphia is 19139. Um, in Center City, we see um, a very, very high prevalence zip code. Um, in 19107. This is likely because there are many shelters located in this area and, um, and at those shelters, uh, individuals who, who are houseless can use, uh, use that address for uh, as their own. And we do know that there is a much higher prevalence of HIV among, among people who are unhoused. So this, this, does, um, this is the reason for that. It, it has more to do with the houseless pop population. In North Philadelphia, there are several high prevalence zip codes, but the highest is 19132. And then you'll see in the Northeast, another high prevalence zip code in 19136. This is because this is where the city's jails are located in the Holmesburg neighborhood. Um, so a lot of uh, when people are go through the intake process for any of the jails, they're tested for HIV. And so a lot of HIV cases are identified um, in the zip code and are attributed to the zip code. Next slide, please. Um, HIV disproportionately impacts Black and Hispanic uh, people. That's through throughout the country, that's through throughout the world, and it's true here, in, it's true here in Philadelphia. Um, so you'll see by race and ethnicity um, that, uh, that in all categories, um, uh, Hispanic and um, Black individuals are, um, are uh, have the highest prevalence of HIV. Um, and of all populations, men who have sex with men are, are the most uh, impacted uh, by HIV. They have the highest prevalence. Um, uh, for people who inject drugs, um, the, uh, the data is not, um, is not uh, differentiated by, by race um, because the cell sizes get too small. 
Um, but you, you do see very much the same uh, pattern among uh, people who inject drugs when you look at prevalence. Uh, next slide, please. So when we're thinking about PEP and who might get PEP, um, PEP needs to be available to anyone who's had an exposure. So anyone who has been um, potentially exposed to HIV, according to, uh, to the, um, the, the um, information that Dr. Koenig just shared with you, should be able to get PEP and they can get PEP by calling and asking for it. Um, because of the way um, HIV disproportionately impacts certain populations in our city, um, the, the individuals you might most likely see um, who are seeking PEP and who, who need to be seeking PEP are in the following populations. These are men who have sex with men, um, black and Hispanic persons, uh, regardless of their risk factor, um, youth ages 13 to 24 years old, um, young adults aged 25 to 34 years old, um, transgender persons of any identity who have sex with men, and finally, uh, persons who inject drugs um, and their sex and needle sharing partners. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2019, which is the most recent year that we have uh, complete data, um, there were an estimated 440 new cases of HIV. This is a little bit different from the number of cases that are diagnosed in a year, because some people aren't diagnosed the year they get HIV. Um, uh, we, we would love for as many people as possible to, to be diagnosed immediately, but sometimes people wait and they don't, they have, they are not tested uh, right away. Um, so there's about 440 new HIV transmissions or incident HIV transmissions in the city. Um, most of them were people who were assigned se male sex at birth, 75%, about three quarters. Um, 61% were black, non-Hispanic. 16% uh, were Hispanic. So together that makes over, that makes about 78% of all of those newly diagnosed with HIV. 61% um, were in the youth and young adult age groups from 13 to 34. 56% um, were MSM and 20% were people who inject drugs. This includes MSM who also inject drugs. Next slide, please. So um, Philadelphia is one of the major cities in the United States that, um, that was uh, selected um, to, um, to have um, to be funded uh, to end the HIV epidemic in the United States. Um, in order, in the early stages of that effort, um, the city uh, worked with many community uh, members to develop a community plan to end the HIV epidemic. Um, and in this plan, our goal is to reduce new infections by 75% over five years. So this plan started in 2020. So the goal was to reduce new HIV cases by 75% by 2025. And the way to do that are a few things. Um, diagnose all Philadelphians with HIV as early as possible so they can get treatment and so that they uh, so that um, that can uh, prevent the spread of onward transmission. Um, treat people living with HIV quickly and effectively. Um, prevent new transmissions by promoting PrEP, PEP, and syringe uh, services. So this is um, the provision of PEP is one of the major um, one of the major um, activities that we need to do to end the HIV epidemic in Philadelphia. People need access to PEP if they've had an exposure. And then finally, respond quickly to HIV outbreaks when they're um, identified. Next slide, please. So we do have some data um, about uh, PEP use in Philadelphia. So um, in 2017, there was an MSM cycle of NHBS, uh, which is the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Survey. Um, and in 2017, it was estimated that PEP use among MSM um, by race ethnicity was relatively stable across populations. So about 14%, 13% of each um, of, of MSM uh, by each, each race, race and ethnicity category was uh, reported recent PEP use. But what I wanna note here is that because black and Latino MSM 
are disproportionately impacted by HIV, we should see higher PEP use among these populations because there, there's more need indicated among these populations. Next slide, please. Um, we have some PEP awareness data um, from both uh, New York City um, and here in Philadelphia. Um, so in New York City, among notified partners of people newly diagnosed with HIV, so these are people at very high risk of HIV um, seroconversion, only about a third of them were aware that PEP was an option for preventing HIV transmission. So there's definitely work to be done on awareness. Those who need it might not need it most, um, such as an individual whose partner was just diagnosed with HIV might not be aware that PEP is an available option for them. Um, another important thing to note that in Philadelphia, um, in the same uh, NHBS survey, we found that among MSM newly diagnosed with HIV, 20% had reported taking PEP at some point in the prior year. This I want to note because these are individuals who once they had PEP were really good candidates for transitioning to PrEP. Um, the, this was an, there was an opportunity there for that individual who got PEP to then convert to PrEP, which then could have prevented um, uh, could have pre prevented uh, zero conversion. So this is definitely a population for which we really need to um, get an offer and encourage to take PrEP once they have um, gotten PEP and finished their course of PEP. Next slide, please. So we have some EHE goals related to PEP. Um, for our overall goals, um, we want to decrease new HIV in infections by 75% by 2025, and then by 90% by 2030. That's our ultimate goal for, um, for EHE initiatives is in 10 years time from when we started, there are 90% uh, fewer uh, new HIV infections in Philadelphia. For PEP delivery in Philadelphia, um, we have a couple of uh, goals as well. We want for 100% of people in Philadelphia for whom non-occupational PEP is indicated uh, prescribed treatment. So if somebody seeks PEP and is indicated for it, we want them to get it. Um, and so we funded this program to, for there to be another, for, for there to be a direct way for individuals to reach out and get PEP in a timely manner. Um, we also wish for 75% of PEP COE patients to be transitioned to pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Um, and this is important for the reason indicated um, that if, if you get PEP, you are likely a very, very good candidate for PrEP. And we would like to get PrEP to you. Uh, next slide, please. All right, that's it. Thanks so much. Hey, I'm going to talk for a little bit about what our program is and what someone who calls the hotline might um, anticipate. Uh, next slide, please. So the program components are a jurisdiction-wide 24-7 call center and brick-and-mortar clinical sites. That means that anyone with a recent HIV um, exposure can call at any time from anywhere in the city. Um, you don't necessarily have to be an existing, pen, uh, an existing patient at any hospital system. Um, we take new patients uh, and get them set up with care at our physical sites. Um, the program goals are streamlined patient-centered workflows, um, medical and navigation staff with awareness and capacity to prescribe PEP and navigation and adherence support services. Um, the calls are going to be answered by um, likely members of a social work team and or clinician. Um, there are medical providers that will speak to all patients who are eligible for PrEP and do an ultimate screening um, and determine ultimate eligibility. The medical providers are ID specialists, so infectious disease doctors at one of the two brick and mortar sites. Um, the navigation staff and the medical providers have an existing working relationship. Um, we all work together uh, full time doing HIV prevention and treatment work. Um, and we're all extremely well versed in our work styles and what makes a good candidate for PEP and or PrEP um, or other harm reduction services. Um, that allows us to serve patients after hours in the same exact way that we currently do serve patients during hours, uh, during business hours. Um, the navigation and adherence support services that we offer folks, uh, because we realize that a prescription for PEP isn't 
isn't actually the hardest part of getting PET for some people. Um, we're able to help folks with insurance, transportation, medical assistance programs. Um, we have grants that allow uninsured patients to be seen for PEP um, and cover the costs of the medical care. Uh, we work, um, normally we work with pharmacies to help patients get their HIV treatment medication. So we're also well versed in kind of um, what it takes to get a prescription approved, um, where patients can get specific medications, things like that. Um, and because we work with a lot of outside organizations, we can make referrals to, to, after someone gets the medical component taken care of, we can make referrals to outside organizations that might help with some of the ancillary um, concerns a patient may have that just isn't um, within the scope of this program. Next slide, please. Um, so, as I said, it's a citywide PEP hotline, um, and we provide initial PEP triage assessment and emergency prescription services without in-person contact. Um, what this looks like is there's a standardized assessment that we use to determine risk of HIV acquisition. Um, the standardization itself allows the call center staff to obtain information in a trauma-informed and judgment-free manner so that all people are being asked the same questions in the same way. Um, for folks who are at higher highest risk, Medication will be prescribed on the spot and visit and labs will be um, obtained later. Um, so the real priority is making sure that someone can get the medication with as early as possible, um, particularly within that 72 hour window. Um, and we can figure out the actual like complicated logistics of getting someone a visit and getting someone lab work and getting all those things paid for after the patient has the medication in hand. Um, we also link clients to brick and mortar sites for uh, remaining PEP regimen and in-person PEP care services. Um, that's what I'm talking about with coordinating things later. Uh, the fact that we have more than one brick and mortar site allows for flexibility in scheduling and insurance requirements um, and accessibility for callers because we realize that not everyone lives in the same um, part of the city and has access to the same transportation options. Both brick and mortar sites are very accessible um, by SEPTA. Um, so uh, we're optimistic that people might be able to get to at least one of the two sites that are offered. Next slide, please. Um, so the goals for the PEP Center of Excellence are to provide PEP regardless of insurance status. Um, and to do that, like I said, we have two sites. One of the sites in particular has access to grant funding um, that allows patients to be seen regardless of insurance status. And we also can help folks who um, are seen initially uh, without insurance to enroll in insurance for longer term care. If they decide to go on PrEP, um, they could, we, that would allow them to continue seeing the providers. Um, we can also help with pr prescription assistance program enrollment. There, it's a fairly easy program, but unless someone knows that it exists, um, they're not going to be able to, to, to enroll in it. So we're, we're extremely uh, experienced in those, in those programs because it's for all, um, they're, they're for all HIV prevention and treatment medications. So we've been uh, using them to get people medication for a long time. Um, we provide urgent care, uh, we provide a urgent care clinical model for PEP. Um, so that's what that looks like is low barrier service provision. Um, so when necessary, scripts will be provided before baseline testing can be obtained. Um, care coordination and follow-up can be arranged during next available business day. Um, we try really hard not to be gatekeepers to the medication. We know that people need it when they need it, and we are willing to, um, from a harm reduction perspective, provide it to people um, and just make, make sure that folks know what the next couple of steps would be to, to uh, be fully adherent and um, have the best outcome for the medication regimen we prescribe. Um, we receive referrals from community-based organizations for PEP. Um, this program itself is truly a community effort. I know um, throughout the city of Philadelphia, there's a lot of organizations doing the same work and we're all going towards the same goal, right? So um, for, thing, for folks or situations that may not be appropriate necessarily for follow-up at our organization or folks who have additional needs that we aren't able to provide, um, we can refer folks to places like FIGHT, YHEP, Prevention Point, um, CHOP, PDPH, uh, the Department of Health, uh, Penn and Ward. Um, one of the goals, like we said, is to convert all appropriate and eligible participants to PREP. 
Um, so when someone calls, again, the initial concern is making sure that they have access to PEP, but that usually involves um, a discussion about whether they know that PrEP exists, whether they've ever been on it before, whether they think that it would be um, beneficial for them. And then during the actual medical visit, that's again discussed with patients. Um, and it's made very clear that it's accessible to anyone that wants it. Uh, even if someone doesn't want it during their initial visit, we'll keep revisiting it. Um, and it's, it's there if people want or need it. Um, and we can also do linkage to HIV prevention services. Um, the folks that work on this team have been doing uh, work along the HIV prevention and treatment continuum for a really long time. Um, so depending on the caller's unique circumstances, we could provide routine testing and follow-up prep. We can engage someone's partner in HIV treatment if they, if they know that their partner is living with HIV but may not be in care. Um, and we can pr provide referrals to and access to harm reduction services um, like syringe exchange, uh, syringe exchange programs and things like condoms. Um, it's kind of like an a la carte menu of prevention services that we offer that's open to anyone who enters our program through either um, a PrEP referral, a PEP referral, or our testing program. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the PEP Center, like PEP Center of Excellence um, that we have formed is built really on the, the data that has come from the New York City Pet Center of Excellence. Um, and so in New York City, they successfully reached disproportionately impacted communities um, through advertising on social media um, and internet-based um, ads and flyers. There was a substantial amount of um, drop off seen between the assessment um, portion of the PEP referral process and linkage to these services um, because of the need for low barriers to appointments like Bridget um, spoke about where we have now decided that we were going to make sure that the provision of the prescription and making sure that the person was able to access the medications came even before we were able to get um, blood work for these individuals. Yes, next slide. Um, so New York City's Pet Center of Excellence did also um, show us that it's important for these services to be based in trauma-informed practices. During the first year that New York City had their PEP COE, um, 3% of the people who called the call center and 14% of individuals who showed up to a brick and mortar site were a part of a sexual assault. And we've actually taken the steps to partner with BOR in order to make sure that even if our call center staff aren't the most um, trauma informed, that we're able to do a warm handoff to people who do this day in and day out. Next slide. So um, in addition to the two sites that Penn Medicine has, uh, we also have um, partners at YHEP, which is a program of Philadelphia Fight. It's the Youth Health Empowerment Project. They see patients from 13 to 24. And the John Bell Health Clinic, which sees adult patients from 18 and older. Um, there's a prep retention coordinator at each of those sites, um, and actually Penn has a, a prep coordinator as well. Um, but they are able to currently see um, about 50 patients um, for NPEP uh, yearly between the two sites that FIGHT has. Um, and between those sites, PEP is completed in its entirety, um, between 40 and 50% in the MSN population as compared to other populations. Um, the proportion of PEP patients who transition to PrEP is also about 50%, um, but that's highest in MSM populations, which I think Helen and Anna both hit on um, are some of the um, populations that we really should be focusing on the most. Next slide. 
Um, BITE has identified that there are a few barriers to probably some of those um, data points that I just spoke on. Um, some of these barriers include providers who don't have the data to properly assess the risk um, for exposure for patients. Um, also, awareness of risk for both the patient and the provider. Um, sometimes, like Helen um, discussed, patients sometimes aren't aware that they should come in within 72 hours. And I'm going to wager a bet that also some people might not come in if they think they're 73 hours and outside the window. Um, there's always the logistics of getting to a brick and mortar site. Um, and also just the knowledge gap between sexual health and prevention strategies. Next slide. Um, these following um, populations are the populations who are most likely to receive PEP based on their risk groups. Um, it would be survivors of sexual assault, individuals in relationships with HIV partners, where the partner is not suppressed. Um, individuals who had unprotected, occasional casual sex with someone of unknown HIV status. Um, individuals who may have multiple casual partners where their HIV status is unknown. And a large proportion of PET patients um, were previously on PrEP, but non-adherent or may have stopped taking PrEP. Next slide. Um, some take-home points, NPEP or non-occupational non PEP um, is a critical HIV prevention tool, but it's underutilized. Um, NPEP started within 72 hours um, of a high-risk exposure uh, for a 28-day course is very effective in preventing tra um, transmission of HIV. Um, we're typically talking about MPEP as Truvada in combination with Raltegivir or Dalutegravir, and we're also using Victarvi as a medication um, to be used for uh, MPEP. And the typical baseline testing is going to be an HIV test um, during the visit after exposure, as well as STI screens kidney and liver um, screenings, a pregnancy test, and then at the end of your 28 days, the medical provider will do another HIV test to make sure that you didn't seroconvert and actually acquire HIV um, over the course of your um, PEP. Um, and then in general, MPEP is safe, well-tolerated, and there's no risk of HIV resistance. Um, should at some point you acquire HIV and have taken these medications in the past. Next slide. Um, some additional take-home points. Some people who would benefit from PEP may not be aware. Um, I think Anna spoke about this a little bit earlier, but in the New York City program, the partners of newly diagnosed HIV-positive people only 34% of those people were aware that PEP was an option for them. We learned some valuable lessons from the New York City PEP program, um, which we're implementing within our program, um, but that mainly we need to make sure that the assessment process, as well as the care that the patient receives is trauma-informed, um, that reaching people where they're accessing their information, i.e. social media, is very important um, and that we really need to make sure that we're not being gatekeepers for the medications and that we're helping people access the medications, even if access to an immediate appointment is not available in the moment, like at two in the morning. Um, individuals who seek uh, non-occupational PEP should be evaluated for conversion to PrEP. Um, since the medications are the same medications that we typically use to um, give people who want to take PrEP long-term. Right, we've dropped the Raltegravir or Dalyotegravir. 
Um, and Philadelphia has rolled out the Pet Center of Excellence um, with the goals of 100% of people who seek PEP um, getting prescribed treatment and 75% of those individuals being transitioned to PrEP. Next slide. This is me. So I'm gonna talk to you about um, some frequently asked questions that we've adapted from our friends in New York City. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that a lot of these questions I anticipate you could all answer from our presentation already, but it's good to review them. So what should you do if you think you've been exposed to HIV? Obviously, the first thing I want to say is give us a call. Call the PEP hotline and we can help you out. Uh, the sooner you call, the better. Um, as is explained already, that 72 hours um, is the technical threshold. However, the sooner you call, the better. Um, you can also speak directly to your doctor to know if PEP is right for you or um, you can go to your uh, local emergency department or what we recommend, giving us a call. Um, we can review things with you to see if you were sexually assaulted, if you had unprotected sex, or did you end up sharing needles with anyone? So what can you expect when you uh, call or talk to someone about PEP? Um, you're gonna be asked a range of questions about your exposure so we can determine if PEP is right for you. Um, you will also be encouraged, or you will be getting an HIV test on your first appointment with your provider. Um, we'd like to know if possible too, if the person that exposed you um, also is HIV positive, we'd love to have them come in to get a test as well, because if they are negative, PEP might not be ideal for you right now. We'd also wanna be testing you for other STIs uh, because HIV is not the only one. Chlamydia, syphilis, Hep B, and Hep C are all highlighted here. Um, we could also discuss with your provider about possible vaccines for other diseases uh, that you may not be vaccinated for already. If you're a person too of childbearing potential, um, we may also recommend a pregnancy test and possible emergency contraception if you feel that's right for you. Um, we'll also, of course, love to discuss with you lowering your chances of acquiring HIV through safer sex practices and through uh, safer needle sharing practices. So how do you take PEP? Um, so once PEP is prescribed to you, there's a couple different routes of taking it. If you end up going to the emergency department and you get medication, they would give you a couple days of this medication and you could follow up with us to help you moving forward from that. If you get a break from us, we would give you the full prescription, which is for 28 days of medication. Um, it's not a morning after pill. It's not a once and done thing. Again, it's 28 days of it, and you are not allowed to skip any doses. And ideally, we want you to take this in the same time frame each day. Um, PEPs also may not work complete, very well with other medications that you would want to discuss with a provider. So you would want to review all those when you call in, um, call the hotline and discuss with a provider. We also say you do not stop taking PEP unless it's told to you by your provider. You do have to complete the full course for it to have the best chance of stopping HIV infection. So does PEP have any side effects? Yes, sometimes there are small, mild side effects like an upset stomach, tiredness, diarrhea, and headaches. Any of these things that you do experience, we would want you to talk to uh, your provider about immediately. Um, there may be other ways to make you feel better besides having you stop the medication. Uh, it's been noted that in most cases, people who do have these side effects decide to still keep taking the medication as to they'd rather avoid getting the HIV than dealing with maybe an upset stomach for a couple of weeks. So how much does PEP cost and how will it get paid for? So unfortunately, there's not a set answer where I can say, oh, it's $23.99 for the month. Um, PEP is covered by a lot of insurances, including Medicaid. However, we are there to help you if there is any co-payment or high deductible that you need to fill out. Um, there are some health programs that provide PEP for uninsured persons uh, with appropriate exposures here in Philadelphia, 
but our pet navigators like myself and Bridget um, can help you with financial assistance programs to cover those costs. Um, so do you need to see a doctor while on PEP? Yes. Um, we ideally would set up an appointment within three days of your, uh, of your start of PEP, um, where you can check in either in, oh, oh, but your provider also then will be in touch with you weekly after that to check in to make sure you're doing well with the medication and not having any side effects. Um, we also like to highlight that after your exposure for about a 12 week period, um, we want you to try to protect your other partners from HIV infection as well by using condoms every time, use birth control and avoid becoming pregnant, uh, do not breastfeed, do not share needles, and do not donate any blood or semen. So what happens after you finish your 28-day course of PEP? Um, again, you're going to come back, you're going to meet with your medical provider, and then you're going to have another HIV test drawn. Um, at the time that you finish your 28-day um, prescription, you're going to also have discussions likely with Bridget or one of our other two prevention navigators that were in the process of onboarding um, to talk about the transition to PrEP, um, which is, you know, talking about protecting yourself, not incidentally, but proactively over the course of the future. Um, I, Oh, back. Thank you. Um, you do still want to use condoms, and um, we can definitely still um, give you the counseling on how to make sure that you're protecting yourself with um, needles and um, clean syringes. Um, we also do have um, a direct connection and can get you in at Prevention Point for some of these resources as well. Um, in some cases, um, PrEP is right for some individuals and we would likely, again, because of our goals and just wanting to protect you for the future, would like to help you transition to PrEP. Next slide. So if you have had more than one course of PEP um, now or in the past, ideally PrEP is a good option for you. Um, you would want to take this medication every day, and PrEP is always one pill, once a day. Um, and you would continue to see your provider for follow-ups. Uh, Bridget touched on this a little earlier. Um, we have one of our brick-and-mortar sites at Penn has um, Title X family planning um, resources to help people, regardless of insurance status, coverage and all of these things, continue to see people, uh, medical providers for access to PrEP, as well as other family planning um, services. Um, so it's not important to worry about the logistics behind it. We'll get it covered and we'll get you in regardless of any of that. Um, and there also may be some copay or deductible insurance um, coverages that we can help you apply for as well. Um, and you absolutely can take PEP if you are pregnant. Um, your medical provider will talk to you about any risks or benefits to you or the baby, um, but you would like, to, not like, you would need to stop breastfeeding for three months after the exposure. Um, you can talk to your medical provider about whether or not you should pump and discard the breast milk. Um, if you want to go back to breastfeeding after this three months has passed. And we just wanted to close out by giving you uh, kind of a glimpse of, of the program is operating and we are receiving calls. We wanted to give you kind of a, an inside glimpse of what might happen and what has happened during previous calls. So just to start uh, some demographics of the caller, because some of it, as we've explained, like a lot of the answers to the questions we ask are determining risk and um, follow up steps and where you might be seen and how you're going to fill your medication. So this is all kind of relevant to going forward with the call. 
Um, this particular caller was a 37 year old cisgender woman who had a consensual uh, condomless penile vaginal receptive sex with a partner of unknown HIV status. Um, she was actually referred by an outside organization. Um, so she didn't call us directly, but one of our uh, networking partners knew that we have this program in existence and called us um, to help her access the medication. Um, the initial hotline contact with the caller, so when we were able to speak to the caller immediately following the referral, was at hour 15 following the encounter, um, which of note was 2 p.m. on a Friday, and anyone that has done this kind of work knows that that's a really tricky turnaround time uh, because insurance companies close early, pharmac pharmacies close early, um, most outpatient doctor's offices close at 5 on a Friday. Um, so they were actually able to be seen in person by a medical provider at hour 17 following the encounter. So they called us at 2 p.m. They were seen at 4 p.m., um, which is ideal. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to let everyone know, like, if someone were to call, what are we going to ask you? And a little bit of the reasons behind why we ask certain questions. Um, most of the things dealing with an HIV a potential HIV exposure is sensitive. Um, it may not have been, it, it may have been uh, a sexual assault and answering the questions is gonna be very tricky. Um, it may be a minor and uh, some of the answers to the questions bring up legal issues. Um, so there, we ask a lot of questions, but there's a reason for every single question we ask. Um, and because of the sensitive, sensitive nature of some of the questions, we've actually worked with um, folks who specialize in sexual assault to phrase the questions a certain way. Um, we've worked with folks who work specifically with adolescents to phrase the questions a certain way um, so that they are pa truly patients as patient centered as we could make them um, while still trying to obtain the information necessary to provide the medication to someone who needs it. Um, there's kind of three different types of questions in our standardized screening. Um, the first part uh, is required for the assessment. So in order for us to determine whether it is safe, um, uh, possible, and uh, a good referral for PEP, we have to ask these particular type of questions, primarily about the exposure. Um, and we have to get uh, some background of like medical history, medication lists, and HIV status of patient and partner if known. Um, and we also have to get a phone number to be able to reach the person back at it. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, uh, their longtime phone number. The program itself is an 833 number so that it doesn't use minutes. If there are any uh, like standing phones in the city, you can call from a pay phone if you could find one. Um, so we call anyone back as long as they're in a safe place and able to be screened, we'll gladly call them at whatever number they provide us. There are There is some information also required for a prescription because there's gonna be a medical provider calling a prescription into a pharmacy. From the pharmacy's end, they have to have a, like a minimal amount of information to even process the prescription. So we are gonna need a legal name if it's an insurance uh, claim. The name we're, we need is gonna have to match the insurance. We're gonna need a birth date and we're gonna need a preferred pharmacy. Um, Depending on the time of the call, it may not be as much as of a preferred pharmacy as the pharmacy that has the medication and is open. Um, but we have done research to find out which pharmacies in the city are 24 hours. We have a little map that we've generated. So if, if a caller calls from North Philly, we know which 24 hour pharmacies are in North Philly. We've personally called all of the pharmacies to just do a, a quick check and see what medication they have in stock at any given moment. Um, so we've done a lot of homework to make sure that although the pharmacy piece may not be ideal for some people because they can't just go down the street to their local pharmacy at two in the morning, um, we tried to make it so that at least we know um, where medication can be found. Um, and as I said, there's also possibly the potential to help the patient access that medication, whether it be working with the pharmacy for delivery if it's during uh, daytime hours or in um, certain situations providing assistance to transportation. Um, the other questions we ask are not necessarily mandatory. If you opt out of some of these questions, we're not going to not give you medication. Um, they're just asked to give the caller a, a better experience and see them as a whole person and not just an exposure. 
Um, so SOGI information and pronouns are really important. SOGI is sexual orientation and gender identity. This helps uh, determine risk, but it also makes sure that we're respecting the caller um, and, and you know, not alienating someone who's calling us for help by not uh, doing the correct thing that we're trained to do. Um, we also ask about potential for pregnancy, as Joe said, because they're, um, we are able to provide birth control if that's someone, something that someone wants, if um, plan B would be uh, reasonable for someone, we're able to take that into consideration as well. Um, and the rest of it is just kind of basic demographic information um, and insurance status is pretty important as well. Um, that will help us know the path that we have to take to get someone the medication. Um, Oftentimes in this field, having insurance isn't actually a, a, a magic bullet. It actually makes the things harder sometimes. Um, so we we like to obtain insurance information because we can tell like from doing this every day, we can tell which medications are covered with no problem by certain insurance plans. We know which ones are gonna need a prior authorization. We know um, if that person can use a copay card with their particular insurance, or if someone is a mail order pharmacy patient and we're going to have a hard time getting them a, a medication from a store. Um, so that's, that is important. But again, any answer to that question is fine. It just helps us plan. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, we, as I said, we did have that one very successful call. It was a quick turnaround time. Patient got medication. Patient was very happy. Um, some interesting things from that call were that privacy was an issue during the call. So the questions were coded. Um, the patient was in her home with her father um, and she said she didn't really have any confidential place to, to answer questions that were open-ended. So um, she couldn't explain the, the encounter necessarily. Um, so what I did was I asked the patient, is it okay if we do a yes or no option? So I read the questions, I read all the options of answers that were listed and I had her say yes to the one that was that was relevant um, so that she didn't have to verbalize it in her home. Um, and we were able to obtain all the required information that way. Um, and we saved some of the other information for a little later when the person was in a better place to answer the questions. Um, scheduling. Uh, as we said, the person called at 2 p.m. Uh, most outpatient offices close at five and, our, and the office the patient was seen at was, was no different. Um, luckily, the patient called on a day where there, were, there was walk-in hours at this office. Anyway, for anyone that needed a visit, there's walk-in hours for that person. And the provider was very amenable to adding them on their schedule. Um, additionally, the caller was already bringing a family member, her father, um, to an appointment at Penn that day. Um, so the patient was able to be scheduled while her father was in his visit. So she could just sneak down to the fourth floor, have her visit, sneak back up to her father to the waiting room and then not have to explain her absence to her father. Um, and that was truly um, a testament to why having more than one site is, you know, kind of ideal because she initially said she wanted to come to the location at 40th and Market, and then she was like, oh, I'm going to have to dr drop my father off and drive and park. And I, it's, it just so happened that we, I was like, oh, you can have a visit in the same building. Um, and that, that probably was what actually made it work so, so smoothly, because if, if she had to drive from 34th and Spruce and park at 40th and Market and then drive back, it would have added so much time onto that experience. Um, our experience in HIV prevention uh, really saved valuable time um, because of the time turnaround. Uh, and again, pharmacies close and insurance closes. We were able to preemptively provide the patient with copay cards should they need them. Um, when she called before she even saw the provider, she was told that uh, about the grant options, the Title 10 funding, in case a copay was a barrier. I believe she had like a $45 office, like a specialist visit copay. Um, the script was able to be processed through our in-house pharmacy to determine coverage even before she had seen the provider. Um, so we knew what that was, what the outcome was going to be of the, of the claim um, before she was actually even ready to pick it up. Um, and all HIV service organization grant funded staff, which is um, anyone in a, the social work department that's answering these calls, um, is trained uh, by ACO, which is the AIDS Activities Coordination Office, on how to best provide services to people living with HIV and at highest risk for HIV infection. So although this program is new, 
Um, none of these barriers were new to our seasoned and well-trained staff. We've all worked in this field for a long time, um, and we are very familiar. And it's just kind of working in this field, you become very familiar of all the ways that um, health isn't really equitable sometimes. So we're, we, we kind of anticipate these barriers along the way um, and hope that they don't happen, but are ready for them when they do. Um, and despite there being an initial delay with coverage, the full PEP regimen was received the same day before she left the building, um, which is pretty spectacular. Uh, because we're a 24-hour program, we um, also provided the patient with the, the PEP hotline directly in case it hadn't worked out by the end of the day and there were still logistical things that had to be resolved um, so that she could call and let us know like, hey, I couldn't get my medication. Um, at like on like Friday at seven or something, someone would answer and problem solve with her for that and work with her throughout um, however long it took to get the medication. And we're always in contact with providers too. So if we needed to switch up the script for coverage purposes or access purposes, we could have done that too. Um, there were also ancillary services made available to the patient during this visit. So uh, the caller was screened for PrEP. Um, the patient ultimately declined PrEP, but was offered ac ongoing access to routine, routine testing and PrEP. So she knows that she can call us if she just wants testing or if she changes her mind and would like PrEP or that's still an option for her. Um, even if it's not part of any existing, like the PrEP visit, the PEP visit or anything, PrEP is always an option as, as is testing. Um, throughout the visit though, family planning was discussed and the, and the provider was able to provide the patient with birth control. Um, and get set up with a pen OBGYN for additional concerns. So um, the transition to PrEP didn't work out, but we were able to, or right now, but we were able to help the patient get access to other healthcare issues um, and, and needs. Um, and that's, you know, part of being in a, like a large network uh, of healthcare providers and healthcare providers with low barrier service provision um, as you give people what they need, when they need it, and kind of figure out some of the other stuff later. So um, she left with PEP, she left with birth control, and now she knows that she can get tested uh, if she were ever to need it. Um, and that's kind of that experience with one of our hotline calls. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we have some time for questions now. I think a couple have been put in the chat. Somebody wanted these slides, and so the link is in the chat. Let us know if you have any trouble um, accessing that. And then I'm not close enough to this computer screen to see this question, um, but it looks like STI, um, PEP, and PrEP. Um, and are we really doing that yet? I will um, give that question to Helen. Uh, to answer. <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to answer that. I want to make uh, just one quick point, actually, um, just because we went through a lot of material, um, and there are a couple things I just wanted to make sure people know as take-home points, and then I, and I'd be happy to, to address that question. One is, because this is a collaboration with YHEP at Philadelphia Fight, we're able to see youth and young adults as well as adults, so there's no age limit really lower or upper on the type of caller who can who we can support. So if you are someone who is under the age of 18, when you call, you will end up communicating with um, a pediatrician or adolescent medicine provider um, at YHEP, um, Youth Health Empowerment Project. And that person also is very informed in terms of when and how to ask if parental consent is appropriate or safe um, so, uh, and making sure if there are any insurance issues that parents or guardians are not, you know, aware of things and, and it's safe for people to obtain medications that they need without worrying about people finding out about things when they wouldn't necessarily um, want folks to know. Again, um, these are adolescent medicine providers who are very skilled in doing this in the way that, that puts the patient first and also tries to take family and guardians into account whenever possible. Um, if you're 18 and older, most likely you will get, um, uh, you will be put in contact with a provider who is at one of our two Penn sites, just as um, Bridget said, both in West Philadelphia. Although again, we're going to end up trying to um, hook, hook the person in with immediate meds. Um, and then the brick and mortar site would be sort of as soon as it's um, feasible to be seen. And, and it would be in a location that's most convenient for the patient. Um, so if you're an adult, but Center City is more convenient for you, Fight might be a better option. 
And there are also other um, places within the city that we could get people into. Again, we want to do the best thing for the caller at the time of the call. Um, so we're going to try and be as flexible as, as, as possible in, in providing that support. Second major point um, was mentioned, but um, it does not matter if you have insurance, if you have had an exposure. So just to reiterate all the wonderful sort of resources Bridget and others went through, but you can be, you will get your um, medicine um, and you can be seen um, regardless of your um, insurance status and or ability to pay. So I think those are um, really important. So any age, any insurance status, any time of day, night or weekend, um, you can access the, um, the PEP um, Center of Excellence call center. Um, and then with that, I just wanted to, I'll address this question from Erin. So, um, uh, <laughs> I will make a very complicated question as easy as possible and give you a, hopefully a very succinct answer. There's some data showing that post-exposure prophylaxis for syphilis um, can be beneficial. Um, there, there, it, there are um, some situations, I think it's certainly not routine, but there are some situations where um, ex post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis with a medicine called baxacycline can be given for syphilis. This is very sort of individualized case-by-case -case basis. There are some providers that are more proactive about this and others that are, you know, uh, are more worried about a lot of the risks, you know, some of the risks in this setting for um, a medication uh, um, for whom there's not a lot of data with respect to like taking doxy daily to prevent syphilis infection. So um, I would say the jury is still out with respect to um, with respect to that. Um, and then there really isn't much in the way of like prep for other STIs standardly at this time. I think sometimes in the, um, or often I should say, in the post-exposure prophylaxis setting, there are situations, especially in, in the setting of sexual assault or rape, where we do give medications prophylactically to prevent against things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, et cetera. So that would again be a case-by-case -case basis and certainly something that we would um, triage the need for um, in, in the context of this call center. Um, but I think, um, but with respect to your specific question, doxy prep, that is not standard of care, but very case by case. Yeah, probably more to come in that data. Um, so while people type in their last uh, questions, I just wanted to say that all the figures from the slides today that relate to PEP are straight from the PEP uh, CDC guidelines. So if you Google CDC PEP, you'll see, you know, the, I think it's like a 16 page document. It has all of the evidence um, for PEP, all of the figures from today's talk and is available to you online. Um, in addition to the recording from this webinar, which I think Harlan provided the link to. Um, we're happy to sort of hang around for any last questions, uh, but thank you again for joining us. And just to reiterate Helen's point, we want to hear from everyone. If there's a, if there's a question, call the hotline, someone is there, and we want to help hook you up with what you need. Okay. Thank you, guys. You did great. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I just want to remind everyone that you can find the video of this webinar at the Philadelphia Fight Community Education YouTube page. It will be uploaded at the end of today. Of today. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you.